the best we can and I think we'll be okay. Um, I want to welcome everyone to tonight's debate between Richard Elsner, the current Park County Commissioner for District 2, and Richie Frangiosa, the challenger. I'm Kelly Kirkpatrick, editor of the Park County Republican Fair Play Flume, and the Flume is honored to be a part of tonight's debate. I believe I can say on behalf of Park County voters, that we are all grateful that each of these gentlemen have agreed to participate in tonight's debate and are looking forward to get to know each candidate better as the evening unfolds. I personally believe we have two very capable candidates in the race and I hope that those of you in the audience will leave tonight's debate feeling the same way. I also want to thank Mike Schmidt and the Platte Canyon School District for offering their beautiful canyon room as a venue for tonight's event. The debate will consist of two segments, the moderator's questions and then the audience's questions. There will be five minute, a five-minute intermission following the moderator's question to select five questions from the audience to present to the candidates and also give everyone a little break between the, the two uh, segments of the debate. Audience, audience members should uh, write their questions on the note cards we provided. Um, once written, uh, if you want to raise your hand, John Rankin, our office manager at the Flume, will be uh, trying to kind of pay attention and, and he'll come over and get your, get your uh, blue slip so that we're not uh, distracting the candidates in any way. Um, we also respectfully request that audience members refrain from interrupt, interrupting candidates or the moderator in any way. And we ask that audience members continue to wear their masks at all times in accordance with health and social distancing measures currently being forced on all PCHS campuses. The debate rules are as follows. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce himself to the audience. Mr. Frangioso will introduce himself first. Each candidate will have three minutes to answer each question from the moderator and two minutes of rebuttal time on each question. The order will alternate with each question. Mr. Elsner will answer the first question, uh, will be first to answer the first question. Mr. Frangioso will answer, the, answer first on the second question, etc. And we'll continue to alternate the whole way. Time limits will be strictly enforced. I'm going to try to take the time, and Mr. Glenn is going to help me if for some reason I'll let someone go over the time. He may say from the back of the room, hey, uh, shut up. So I appreciate his help with that. Um, with regards to audience questions, each candidate will have three minutes to address each question in that section, in that segment of the debate. There will be no rebuttals in that portion of the debate. As with questions from the moderator, we will alternate the order in which candidates answer. No more than five questions will be selected just simply due to time constraints. I wish we could read them all. All of them are important, but we just, we only have so much time. So
So with the formalities having been covered, let's get the debate started with two-minute introductions from each candidate, followed by questions from the moderator. Mr. Frangiosa, if you will please get us started with your introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just do one of these if you can't hear me. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Kelly and the Flu for uh, hosting this debate. I'd also like to thank Mr. Elsner for agreeing to speak with us tonight. Uh, I think it's extremely important that our residents get an opportunity to uh, hear the views and opinions of the people that are going to be voting for in November. Uh, my name is Richie Frangiosa. You might have just heard my campaign manager, Oscar, over there. Um, I live in Shawnee with uh, him and uh, my wife, Oscar, and I'm running for uh, county commissioner as a libertarian. And uh, for anyone that might not be familiar with the libertarian platform, it's quite simple. Uh, basically, I strongly oppose any government interference in your personal business and family lives. I believe that all Americans should be free to live their lives in the way they see fit, pursue their interests, as long as they don't do harm to another. And that predicates pretty much all of my political views and everything that I stand for. Um, and this means that the government, including the Bar County government, should exist only to help and support our residents and their goals and aspirations. You know, we live in the most beautiful place on earth, among some of the finest people on the land, and we can keep and share that beauty while still providing the essential services needed to help our community prosper. And when I talk about our community, I mean all of our county. You know, what's best for Bailey isn't necessarily best for Hortzel. What's best for Guffey isn't necessarily best for Ron. And we need to, uh, basically, any laws or ordinances or anything that we look at, we need to look at for all part, right? We can't have something more exclusionary for one and less for another, or something that benefits a particular district or neighborhood over another. You know, we're there to serve all of our county. So, you know, if you would have told me five years I'd be standing here running for office, I would have laughed you out of the room. Uh, I'm, you know, a successful business owner. I have a wonderful life, a wonderful family. I love what I do. And the last thing myself, or especially my wife and my child needs, is the stress of running for office. It's also ironic that the only way to push for smaller government is to run for that office. But at the end of the day, this county is my home. It's where I raise my son. It's where I run my business. And it's where I support and am supported by my friends and family. Uh, and I feel obligated to offer my time and energy to serve that goal. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Thank you for showing up. This is a pretty good turnout, given the, the COVID requirements and the masks and uh, all of that fun. Uh, I'm Dick Elsner. I'm, I'm your current county commissioner. A little background. My family homesteaded in Colorado in 1872. Uh, I grew up in Arapahoe County. I went to the University of Arizona, where I met my wife, who's sitting down here. We've been married now 46 years, so when I do make a commitment, I, I make a strong commitment. Uh, when I first ran four years ago, uh, it was on the idea that our county government has gone too far. At that point, they had just adopted what I considered uh, very restrictive camping regulations. Uh, they were looking at other regulations that were going to limit the, how you could do things on your property. I'm against a lot of the restrictions, but we also have to remember that we live in neighborhoods. What you think is, oh, gee, you know, leaving my light on at night because I, I'm afraid of the, the furry animals outside. To your neighbor, that may not be a good idea because they may like it to be dark. So we have to have laws because people have a different opinion as to what is reasonable, what is fair. What is responsible? And we we'll some guardrails around that to where we have some rules that say, you know, yeah, you can have your light on, but you know, at 10 o'clock, you need to turn it off unless it just points down on your property. You don't want to light up your neighbor's house. Noise. You know, there's a certain time where you've got to stop making noise. Someone may want to go to sleep. These are the, all the type of laws that a county can do. We need to restrict them. We need to keep them at a minimum so people can enjoy their property. But you also have to recognize that everything you do is going to impact your neighbors. So unless you, you, you know, I just have to say that the job as a county commissioner, I think half of it is, to, is neighborhood disputes to where the commissioners end up moderating. That was red flag for blue flag. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate that. The first question we said, Mr. Elsner revealed this. 
With ever increasing traffic on US Highway 285, what is your plan or vision for improving the situation and modernizing the highway considering that CDOT is apparently without the financial resources to do so? Um, you know, that it's a US highway. So, of course, Park County has no ability to do anything on the highway whatsoever. I once volunteered to cut a branch off of a tree because it was obscuring a sign on there right away, and they got mad at me because I volunteered to do that. The, uh, the biggest thing that, that we need to do is work with CDOT and try to figure out how we can push our projects forward because we do have a lot of projects. You take a look at it, uh, since I was uh, served as commissioner, um, I've gotten a bill grant for bridges. It's a, a bridge grant, and it's to repair bridges. The first one is going to be uh, going on this summer. The other side of Fair Play, if you're familiar with it, it goes across uh, the middle fork and has a tendency to fall down, or would fall down, they think, if they had high water, so they'll close 285. We've got three bridges on Highway 9 that are kind of in the same condition, and then we've got a bridge over on Highway 24. So that's the, the first part. The second part of it is to make sure that our projects that have been identified continue to uh, gain the attention of CEDA. The big one right now is uh, the replacing the light, or not replacing the light, replacing the intersection in Fairplay uh, between Highway 9 and 285. It's about a $15 million project. It is now on the books. They've uh, done a preliminary design and we're looking at the final coming up and they uh, hope to advertise for that, I think, uh, either this spring or, or later. Um, we need to continue put, uh, looking for other grants. There's a, a freight grant which will allow us to uh, add some passing lanes and it's a chain up station that's a truck parking. So we constantly, we just constantly need to keep pushing CDOT, bringing our issues up in front of CDOT. When our bridge was uh, added up here at the top of Crow Hill, uh, the county took a very, uh, I don't know, adversarial position with CDOT, fought where they wanted to put it, which would have been a lot better location than it is now. So CDOT put it where it was, and to be honest with you, it made CDOT rather angry that we gave them so much trouble, and that was the last thing they did for us in Park County. So we need to constantly keep working with CDOT, keep pushing, keep trying to find the funding, but it's a U.S. highway. We can't do any work on it. The money has to come from the federal government or the state government. The county can't do it, of course, obviously, at the, the cost that they uh, they incur when they start try to do something on a, a U.S. highway. The county can't do it. Um, let's see. Oh, one other thing really quick. There was a uh, sales tax question on the ballot two years ago. It was to add a 0.62% sales tax statewide. If that would have passed, CDOT would have gotten the money to be able to build the road from Richmond Hill to the top of Crow Hill. Four lane. It didn't pass. We didn't get the project. Well, it's, uh, it's refreshing to start off a debate with something that we can agree on. Um, you know, it, it is a state road. There's very, we're very limited in what we can do to press the CDOT. Um, we can lobby them, we can work with them, we can try to press them uh, to, to further our interests. At the end of the day, there's two things that happen here. One is that we need to concentrate what we, what, on what we can do which is our county roads. We need to prioritize our county roads, as well as other things in our budget, like our sheriff's department, like our first responders, over some of the less pressing things in our budget that could make way for those pressing items. The second thing is, is that, yes, we, don't, we do need to cozy up to CDOT, but we also need to stand up to them in certain ways. There are a lot of things that CDOT does, and I'm sure we'll get into this later in the evening, that are bad for Park County. Let's not get this confused. CDOT does not care about the residents of Park County. They care about traffic flowing through our county. So if we are going to work with CDOT in order to uh, do what's best for both people flowing through the county and our residents and our businesses and the safety of our residents, sometimes we need to push back too. 
We can't just capitulate to everything they ask us to do. Yes, we should work with them. With. Yes, we should be friendly with them. Yes, we should share our ideas and our insights with them. But it's not a one-way street, and we need to stop treating it like it is. Um, pushing back, yes, we do need to, to push back, which we do. Um, the CDOT, I, I know everybody says, well, CDOT doesn't care about it, CDOT doesn't do this. CDOT really does. I mean, they're a bunch of people just like you. Um, they live in towns. We happen to be part of Region 2, which their headquarters is in Pueblo. Um, region 2 is a very big region. We're in the northwest corner of it. If you go down to Teller County, you go due east. And then go to Fremont County to do south, that whole corner is part of Region 2. So we do have to share our money with uh, a lot of people. CDOT does try to help. Um, one of the grants I got was a bridge grant for uh, the bridge that goes to more lumber down in Bailey. Those culverts are rusting out, they need to be replaced. We have a grant to do that. We will be doing that next summer. The problem is, all of those grants require a match, and that is a 50% match, so we have to have 50% of the money to put in. CDOT puts the other 50% in. We have, we, when you're working with a big state organization, if you attack, they become defensive. If you work with the people involved, which is what I try to do, is get, a, get to know the people working on it, you get a lot further. When I talked about the light with them, and it'll, it'll come up again, but Arcadia is an example. Uh, taking Arcadia up to 72, well, that would solve half the problem. The thing is, CDOT doesn't have the money to do that. So I said, well, how about you guys buy all the material and then the county does the work? Because we can do the work if you provide everything. Their response was, we'd love to partner. Maybe we can do that. So these are the type of uh, issues that working with CDOT you get. And CDOT is going to do what CDOT wants to do, but they really want to do what is best for the people in the area. Again, it's great to work with other agencies. Maybe we'll do that isn't enough for me. You know, maybe we'll fix the problem that we are creating isn't enough for me. So, you know, the answer seems to be whenever we talk about something that requires money, is taxes, right? Oh, if they would only pass the tax or the, the state sales tax, if we would only pass our, our uh, half percent sales tax, if we can only do something with 1A, you know, we need to stop thinking that taxes are the only way to fix our problems and start looking at the ways that we can fix our problems internally through creative spending, through utilizing our resources better, and from looking for help from our citizens. So I know that's a little bit off topic for this question, but it applies to pretty much everything in this question, right? If we're going to need those matching funds for CDOT, let's come up with them, let's get a commitment from CDOT that they are going to do what they say they're going to do, and let's move forward. I'm not against working with other people. I want to work with other people. At a certain point, when you're getting the short end of the stick, you got to stand up for yourself as a county, you got to stand up for yourself as a local government. Thank you, Kelly. More specifically, but also pertaining to U.S. Highway 285, citizens in District 2 seem to be overwhelmed, overwhelmingly opposed to CDOT's plans to remove the traffic light at, at U.S. Highway 285 and County Road 43A. Do you oppose the removal of the light? And if so, what can you, as commissioners, do to prevent its removal? This will be treated as its own question, separate question. Each candidate has three minutes to answer and two minutes every vote. So you asked the question, what, as commissioner, could I do? Well, I'm, I'm a private citizen right now, and that means that I can do very little. I'm also one of those private citizens that vehemently opposes the removal of the light of you know, this is something that we needed to address a year ago, a year and a half ago, and we didn't. So, you know, what can I do? Well, there's a couple things I can do and have done. Um, you know, but first let's talk about the removal itself. Now, let's be clear, I'm not opposed, I'm not fundamentally opposed to the removal of the light. I'm 
fundamentally opposed to the removal of the light without a plan. Okay? CDOT does not have a plan to help our businesses in that corridor. CDOT, CDOT does not have a plan to help our residents there. So CDOT is basically coming in and saying, we are going to cause you a problem, deal with it. It has the potential to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars in the county to fix and maintain the roads that have become that are going to become those new traffic patterns. It has the potential to lose those businesses up to 30 or 40 percent of their revenue, possibly making them go out of business. This is a huge deal. Okay? Now the commissioners, as far as I know, have not been vocal in their opposition to this. So the citizens have had to do so themselves. There's a group called Save 285 that gets together and has, on their own, tried to come up with plans to go to CDOT with, with rebottles, with uh, um, different solutions, not just going in and complaining, but coming in with solutions. You know, as private citizens that are concerned about their community, and the reason they have to do that is because our government won't. Like, now don't get me wrong, I am super proud of our citizens for doing that. I am proud to be a part of it, and I'm glad they're continuing to fight that good fight. But without the support of our government and our commissioners, there's very little they or I can do. So, should that light go? No. What they should do is take that money they want to spend, put in a smart light, restrike the roads, and spend whatever's left over doing a real, honest to goodness traffic study instead of one that was done 16 years ago on a Tuesday. Okay? Like, I'm sorry I get a little heated about this topic because it affects my friends, it affects my family, and it affects the people I love. So, um, to answer your question, what can I do? Well, I'm doing all I can. Maybe we can do more in November. I think the, the first thing I want to say is his uh, characterization that the commissioners aren't doing anything about this is totally wrong. Um, we do. We don't make a lot of noise because we're working with these people. We have lots of projects going on that we're working with CDOT to try to get resolved. To be accused of not doing anything about it, you know, that, that, that makes me a little angry. Because we are. We're all working with CDOT, we're talking with CDOT, we're coming up with solutions, we're coming up with alternatives. One of the things that, uh, as I say, getting Arcadian, uh, that would fix that sign. Because people coming up, Rosalind could go up Arcadian and then they could get on the highway. That, right, that fixes half the problem with the light. People say, well, yeah, but I want to be able to turn left out of uh, Rosalie and then turn right out of 43A. That caught CDOT by surprise. People said, well, that's because they don't know what, what it's like. That is an illegal turn. If you take a look, you've got a solid white line, which is illegal to cross. That solid white line doesn't start or stop until the next one starts. So you've got to look at it that you know, CDOT is trying to do this. We think I think we've got a, maybe a solution for Arcadia, which would be, I think, great. It would fix that side of the problem. Then we have the other side of the, uh, the problem when uh, turning left into the businesses. The uh, option came up that maybe we can go down to where Bulldogger used to go down to 285. They'd have a left turn lane there, so if people drive past, they can turn left. That that work too. When he says hundreds of thousands of dollars to maintain county roads, that's, that's fiction. Uh, that's not going to be something that happens. We have 43, which is a little old, but most people should not be using 43. That would be a bad way. It's a speed limit of 25 miles an hour. If you go down 43A, you can make a right turn without stopping. You can go up, you can go underneath the bridge, and you can head north to, to Denver, or you can head south. Am I against removing the light? If we can't come up with some concessions, some options, yes, I am. But I'm still working with CDOT trying to improve situation overall, not just say, well, we aren't going to remove the light because you can't do this. I've lived up here 41 years. I don't know, when we moved up here, 285, four lanes stopped at Parmalee Gulch. It gradually moved up the mountain. When they had the light in Aspen Park, Conifer, Boxton, and I think there was one other down there. On a Sunday, going to a Bronco game when I'd have tickets, it was faster for me to go from Pine Junction down to Buffalo Creek, over to Foxton, and then back up. It was faster than turning left onto 285. We're going to have inconveniences. The people down in Aspen Park had huge inconveniences when that mess was going on. 
once it was done, it's a lot better. The people in fair play are going to have a huge inconvenience. When theirs is done, once it's done, it will be better. So I'm honestly glad to hear Mr. Elsner say that he's been working with CDOT. Um, the problem is, is that nobody knows about it, right? So, you know, the only comment that I've heard from Mr. Elsner on the situation at the light is, oh, it would be great for the people in Berlin, they should want it. You know, first off, I've never heard anyone from Berlin say that. Second off, we're more than Berlin, okay? Um, now, talking about an inconvenience, it's more than an inconvenience. That's the only way out <laughs> from Harris Park all the way up. You know, it goes directly in front of the fire station. They're going to have to put a light in there. This isn't an inconvenience. This is our safety, right? It also is the businesses. Can you imagine taking a fifth wheel north on 285, getting off at 72, going under the bridge, up to 43A, making a right, and trying to get to the loafing jug? It's not going to happen. They can't make that turn, okay? A tanker can't make that turn. Like, and to say that, oh, it'll just be a little bit of money to try to maintain that road, if you're doubling or tripling the traffic on a road that can't even handle the traffic that it has now, and you're putting in a light, like, I, I don't understand how that's not going to cost us money. If we can get it done without money, I am all in. Sign me up. Uh, but it's not just an inconvenience. This is something that matters, and it's something that matters to almost everyone I speak to. And it doesn't just affect everyone up there. It affects everyone in Bailey. It affects everyone that, that uses the stoppages of that light to actually get out and back onto 285. When you're coming out of the, the Conoco here, you can tell when the light stop traffic because there's actually a gap for you to get out there. You know, the, making a left into uh, Glen Isle backs up more traffic than that light ever did. We're not touching that. You know, so the whole thing is a farce in my opinion. They're trying to spend the money on something because they need to spend the money on something and they're not taking into account the needs and the wants of the residents of Earth. Thank you. County commissioners expressed the need to make considerable budget cuts last year and warned that, that more may be on the way in the very near how would you describe the county's current financial health and what are commissioners, I'm sorry, and what can commissioners do to find or replace funding for the county rather than simply making more cuts? Um, the financial health of the county right now is really pretty good. It's not as good as we would like it. Um, we've had to make some cuts this year, and most of those cuts have been, uh, well, they're all COVID-related. Since COVID hit, our income has been down quite a bit, as you can imagine. So we have had to do some things, but all of those have been higher increase. If you lose somebody, maybe you can't replace them quite as fast. Um, you know, trying to, to make it as easy as possible. Um, so, you know, and then you look at it, um, that, well, the hiring freeze, you look at all of our departments, Road and Bridge coming up is going to be a problem. If you look at HUTF funds, HUTF funds are going to be down probably around five to $600,000 next year over what we would have expected. That's five or $600,000 we don't have to spend on our roads. What that does to us is instead of having projects that is, okay, we're going to go spend some money, buy a bunch of material and fix a road, most of the work we're going to be doing over the next year is just maintenance. Grading, fixing culverts when we need to, you know, if something gets washed out, obviously we'll fix that. But we're going to be cutting back a lot on our projects, mostly because we can maintain our current staff, our equipment, and everything with the money that we have. So we're safe from that standpoint, which is why uh, when uh, I was talking to CDOT, they said, yeah, maybe we can come up with all the material that will do the work. Well, we've got a lot of people that we might be able to say, hey, now have a project to do that we don't have to buy any of the material for. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at is, of course, you know, computers. When you computerize things, they, they really help quite a lot. You can fix your staff. I think the uh, treasurer's office is a prime example. She used to have seven people in that office. She's now down to three and a half because she can automate so much. The uh, assessor's office is looking at the, the same thing. Clerk and recorder is a little bit different. Uh, 
because she, they have to do so many things. You know, their motor vehicle, and they've got all these other things that they have. So it, it's a little bit different. Um, the uh, the big thing that, and you know, we'll talk about this later, is our proposition or our ballot initiative one A. It says without an increase in tax, it is without an increase in tax. Basically, we are limited by Tabor with what we can collect. We have a Tabor cap. We can't go above that. What it does is it protects us from the whims of the state legislature down in Denver, who um, is, they, they respond to what's going on in the metro area. And down there, housing prices have gone up a lot faster than ours. So there's a lot of pressure from down there saying, hey, you got to cut our taxes, you got to cut our property taxes. The legislature's probably going to end up doing something like that, which, if they cut it too, too far, will hurt Park County where we can't provide the services that we currently do. Okay. So uh, first, I want to make one thing clear. I will never, ever entertain raising taxes or creating new taxes in Park County. Period. I had a call from a constituent, it's not a week ago, that said, okay, I have a couple questions. Uh, you know, one of them is, you know, between me and you, I won't tell my neighbors, tell me the scenario in which you raise taxes. And my answer was, I won't. There, there simply is not. We have the money we need in our county, and as Mr. Elster said, financially we are okay right now. You know, we don't need additional taxes. We don't need uh, to raise any taxes. We need to put the funds we have to use in a better way. We need to reprioritize how we're using those funds, where they're going, what they're being used for. We need to cut the waste and the pet projects from our budget and put that money towards our first responders and towards our roads and bridges. You know, the county currently has a lot of land that for whatever reason, and I haven't been able to get a reason, we're not selling. It's not selling. <laughs> you know, a lot of that land could be put to use. A lot of that land could be put to use not only to use the proceeds and the sales to bolster our budget, but also we could stipulate that some of that land sale comes with the added condition that the developer that buys it builds affordable housing, which we are much in need of in this county. Housing for the deputies that come up here that can't afford to live in Park County and have to live elsewhere. Housing for our schooling staff. Housing for you know any, <laughs> anyone that can't afford to live in Park County, which is pretty much everyone right now. Um, there are creative ways to use our budget that we're not exploring because we're deciding that taxes are the only answer, which they absolutely are not. Finally, you know, it's not my job as commissioner to tell the sheriff or anyone else how they should do their job in order to get the budget they need. I trust our elected officials and our staff to be experts in their field and to tell me what they need to get the job done. My job is to find the money. It is not to tell them where to cut or how to do it cheaper. It is to find the money. And I think that's something we really need to concentrate on. Finding the money is always one of those magic bullets they always say when they don't have a good solution. Uh, I'd like to know where we can find the money. It's, it's not available. If you take a look at our budget, our budget is somewhere around $34 million. Okay, we only collect about $9 million from the taxpayers of Park County. The rest of that comes from federal government, built funds, HUTF funds, which is the Highway User Tax Fund for Road and Bridge, and grants to uh, Health and Human Services. So the vast majority of the money that we have in our budget is not ours. We cannot touch, we cannot move. Richie likes to mention pet projects. He had one post where he, he said that the, the parking lot in Fair Play and the two, the two toilets in Lake George, those are pet projects. Those came out of the Land and Water Trust Fund. The two toilets in Lake George are part of Badger Basin. It is our attempt, and we'll talk about this a little later when we get into ATVs, it's our attempt to try to reclaim Park County for residents of Park County. The other one, the parking lot, is the fairgrounds. We purchased uh, land for the fairgrounds so we could expand our fairgrounds. Why did we do that? Our fair has grown almost exponentially. We have over, well, we have almost 500 kids involved in 4-H in Park County. We've got close to 100 families that are involved in 4-H in Park County, and that is our fair. 
It is one of the best things that we can do to for our kids, for 4-H, and for our economic development. This last year we had our first professional rodeo ever in Park County. We also had barrel racing in Park County. So if you like rodeo, you like barrel racing, they happen in Park County. We've never had that before. That was done during COVID. The reason we can have the fair was because of the pet project. Also, when you get into the Land and Water Trust Fund, that money was voted on by the people of Park County for that fund. It cannot be used for anything other than land, water, and outdoor recreation. That is the only place we can apply those funds. It is a lot of money that we're bringing in. Uh, the Wayfarer ruling increased our sales tax a lot. We bring in about a million and a half dollars a year in sales tax to the Land and Water Trust Fund. We need to spend it. You know, if we're going to tax, we better spend it. So we need to look for projects. It's done an awful lot of good for Park County. We've done an awful lot of reclamation of some of the streams that have been destroyed. It is good. It's hard working money for Park County. Another one he may mention is the South Park Heritage. We do put up a match for that, but that's $450,000 from the National Park Service. We are one of the few places that has a heritage area, and it's funded mostly by the U.S. government, National Park Service. It's something that is good for Park County. It keeps Park County where it is in the way it is. First off, I love the Park County Fair. My family has won uh, the uh, Grand Champion Land two years running, and uh, our freezer is full. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so, Mr. Elsner brought up the uh, toilets in Lake George. You know, this is a letter from the Land and Water Trust Fund Board. It was sent to Mr. Elsner on June 29th. And it says that they unanimously oppose the use of those funds. Now, this is the board that's responsible for advising on where to put the funds. It says specifically, $100,000 for two toilets on USFS land is not an appropriate use of PCLWTF resources. This funding sets a precedent for tax revenue of this magnitude to be used for a facility that rightly should be paid for by federal tax resources. Everyone I've spoken to in Lake George in the area says they were opposed to it. So if you have the residents, they don't want the money spent. You have the board that says the money shouldn't be spent. Why did we spend the money? That's why I called a pet project, because the only one that seemed interested in spending our money, not their money, our money, was the commissioner. Now, yes, that money can't be used for other things like our sheriff, for example, but it can be used for things that are more productive. It can be used for things that the very board <laughs> that is supposed to be overseeing this money wants it to be used for instead of something they unanimously oppose. When you talk about parts of the budget that are mind-boggling, we started the year with our self-insurance fund being at negative $700,000. We have to claw ourselves out of a hole every year because we choose to self-insure. That could be outsourced without the liability. I would gladly pay two or $300,000 more a year as a county to not have a $700,000 liability hanging around my neck. There are places in the budget that we can remove waste. You need a new set of eyes to be able to find it. Third question. Competition for outdoor spaces in Park County continues to grow. As recreational vehicles such as ATVs and dirt bikes become increasingly popular, should these activities be more restricted in Park County or should the county cater more to these types of activities? Please provide a working example of how commissioners might have an impact on these types of issues in the All right. Fair enough. Thank you. So, I 100% support working with local groups to try to support and cater these activities. Okay. One of the issues I think we have as a county is that we don't accept help very well, even from our own residents. We don't have the uh, we don't have things in place in order to be able to accept help and assistance. 
So, you know, I've been approached by many groups that are advocating for opening up a lot of these trails, such as a, the Colorado Off-Road Enterprise, Predator Four-Wheel Drive, Colorado Off-Rail Trail Defenders. These groups are willing to provide the resources to maintain these trails. These groups have already done the legal leg legwork to be able to work with the county commissioners to open them in a safe and environmentally friendly, friendly manner. We have people that want to work with us on this, and it will not cost us money to do so. And it's one of the things that kind of plagues this county, right? If you, if you go on the website, do, do any of you know how to find out if there's an open board position? Do any of you know how to find out if there's something you can volunteer for, something to help your county out with? You know, when, about a year and a half ago, before I ever decided to run for commissioner, I decided I wanted to c contribute by running for a board seat, right? So I went to go see what was open. And about five pages down, I found the list of the people that sat on the boards and saw a bunch of vacants. That's the only way I knew they were open. There was no Facebook post. There was nothing on the front page where it should be on our county website. So I contacted the county. No one got back to me. I contacted them again. No one got back to me. So I ran into Mr. Elster at a Chamber of Commerce meeting. Told him what was going on. Hey, I want to volunteer. I want to help. How can I do this? He gave me his card. I said, give me a call. Give me an email. I'll, I'll help sort it out. It's about a year and a half ago, and I have yet to receive an email or a call. This is one of those instances where we have people that want to help us. And we're not giving them the time of day. I've seen them stand in front of the Board of County Commissioners and say, hey, here's a fully detailed plan on how we can reopen these safely and efficiently. And the board basically says, nah, it doesn't fit our, our view of how we want Park County to run. You know, let's let them have their say. Let's let them show us how they can help us. And let's welcome that help so that it not only helps the residents of Park County, but it helps increase the amount of people coming in here as tourists. Because honestly, that's part of our lifeblood here. The more people we can get enjoying Park County in a safe and responsible way, the better we all are. Um, the area he's talking about is called uh, the Gulches or the Canyon. It's Wildcat Canyon. It's uh, down by Lake George. The Forest Service uh, closed the roads. We didn't close them. Forest Service closed them. To open them, we would have to take them back. And that is a cost to the county. He likes to say it's no cost to the county, but if we take roads back, it's going to cost the county some money. He'd like to say, well, they had this complete plan in front of us. They have no plan in front of us other than a lot of waving hands, we've got good people, we'll do it. If any of you have done four-wheeling in Colorado, and I did it when I was younger, you'll notice that you know, Mount of the Holy Cross was one of those great trails. You'd go up there, and you know, for about five years, it was very well maintained by four-wheel drive clubs. Then they lost interest. And then, you know, it just went to hell. It was destroyed. That is the type of thing that this happens. He says, well, we need to bring uh, people into Park County uh, because the tourist dollars, they don't come into Park County. That starts in Teller County. They end up driving up the Terriol River because that's the only way you can do it. So now you're driving in one of our streams. And you're driving into Park County, and then you're turning around and going back into Teller County. There are absolutely no dollars that are coming into Park County. It is not for the benefit of Park County. That's, you know, so I look at everything as what is good for Park County. He mentioned the uh, the toilets and the people, everybody down there was against it. Well, that was before, because they did not understand. The Forest Service has a $2.2 million project that they want to do down there. We have 650 dispersed campsites in an area that's partially residential, partially agricultural. And the Forest Service says it can only handle 250. Residents down there, I get more complaints from residents down there about people shooting illegally, running their ATVs illegally, and doing all of that. Polar Pavilion was the first step of that $2.2 million project. If you show the Forest Service you're interested, we're willing to step up, they're going to then look for the rest of the money, they're going to do the rest. The Pavilion added, yes, two vault toilets. If you've ever been up on top of Kenosha when it was locked, you can't say, oh, we need vault toilets. It also does some, neat, uh, some handicapped camping. And the idea is to take that 650 dispersed camping with no control, put it, get it down to 250 with some control because they are absolutely destroying the county now. If you've ever gone to Texas Creek over by Taylor Reservoir and seen what 
ATVs can do, they can destroy a county. What we're trying to do is work with the Forest Service. The Forest Service doesn't want to open it. I don't want the county to take on the responsibility of having the trails open. They say, yeah, we'll do it. Well, okay, first time they roll something, our sheriff is going to have to go down and investigate, find out what, you know, why are you upside down in the creek. We're going to send our resources down, our search and rescue, our fire department down to pull them out to get everything done. That is a cost to the county. If we open them up, those things will happen. That is an additional cost to the county that I don't think we should bear. You know, I think it's very telling that the response that was given was, well, the people were against it because they don't understand. You know, I trust the residents of Park County to understand what's best for themselves. I trust them to be able to convey to me or to our government what they think is best for ourselves and what their needs are. I can't fathom passing an ordinance or spending money because I think that I know better than the people that elected me. So when we talk about those, one of the, to bring this letter back up again, just because it, it specifically says here, one of the concerns they had, it's, you know, we're talking about, oh, we need to send resources down there, we need to have less people down there, we need to have more enforcement down there. There's one U.S. Forest Service law enforcement officer 2.5 million acres. One, we expect that we're going to just magically be able to enforce things now? That's why they didn't want it there. <laughs> you know, it's, and as, as to the, um, as to spending money regarding the ATV trails, we can apply for easements. It's right there in the proposals that have been provided. When he says that they didn't have a plan, he didn't look at their plan. I sat there and watched as they held up at the podium a binder with a plan. Do you want to see this, county commissioners? And the answer was no, we don't need to see that. We've made up our mind. If we're not listening to our constituents and we're not listening to the people that want to help, what are we doing up there? Thank you. We are listening to our constituents. Um, I challenge them to come up with people in their groups and live in Park County. So far, I don't have anybody. I do have emails from people in Park County that say, thank you for protecting the gulches. Thank you for protecting it. It is a unique area. It is pristine. I, I have backpacking in there. It is gorgeous. You run jeeps through there, you're going to mess it up. I have yet to receive someone who lives in Park County say, hey, I really want you to do that. I have received from Park County residents, no, I don't. As far as the, they really didn't understand when the, when they sat down and went through the plan. And this is two of our members on the, the Land and Water Trust Fund board, and they actually looked at what the Forest Service was proposing. They changed their mind. They said this is a good idea. The idea of not doing it. What you're doing is you're taking something that is totally out of control and not trying to do anything about it. When they put the pavilion in, when they start doing these campsites, you go from the one guy for however many millions of acres to each campsite will have a concessionaire that is to manage it, and they are then going to uh, enforce it. Signs will be up, no dispersed camping. They're trying to get it under control. Our county is being attacked by the people who live down in Denver, not in a you know, a way that's mean necessarily. They want to come up and have fun in our county. They want to tear our county apart because they don't have the room down there. So they come up here, they run their ATVs, they want to destroy the gulches because that's what will happen. It has happened in the past. Um, so I am looking after what is best for the residents of Park County. And as we go forward, I will continue to do that. If the Forest Service says, you know, we really don't think this would be wise, it wouldn't be good to open this up again, I'm in favor of following what the Forest Service says because I think that is a good idea. Okay. <coughs> the core question here is what is your political 
philosophy or brand. Is political ideology relevant in one's capacity as a commissioner? And if so, how? Please provide a working example of how one's political ideology might impact his or her decision making process as a Park County Commissioner. Um, I don't think it's any secret to the people of Park County that I'm a Republican. I've chaired the Republican Party in Park County for eight, eight years ago. Eight or ten years, I can't remember. I'm, you know, treasurer of the state Republican Party. So, yeah, I'm a Republican. Um, when you get into a position of a county commissioner, there really should not be any political party affiliation because you really represent everybody in Park County. When you're confronted with a problem, it's not my ideology that should dictate where I go. It's taking a look at the issue the problem and figuring out what would work the best in Park County. Trying to be open to a lot of different ideas. I like to say trying to think outside the box of ideology to come up with the best solution. President Bush, the first one, made a statement when he ran, no new taxes, read my lips. It's not going to happen. Two years later, he raised taxes. We don't, in Park County, we commissioners do not raise taxes. You, the people, raise taxes. We can't raise a tax. We can put it on the ballot. And if the majority of people in Park County say, you know, being on the ballot, we think this is really important, we need to do that, well, people of Park County will decide whether they want that tax. The first tax I put on was a 2% for the uh, emergency services. That was an easy one. I knew that one was going to pass. And it failed miserably. The next one was a half percent for the sheriff's department. That was a little tough. I really think our sheriff's department is stretched in their resources, and that would have helped a lot. So, okay, I put that on, and it failed. So, you know, people in Park County don't want to raise taxes. That's fine. Uh, as long as you understand that you you won't get your your services. But ideology, really, when you get into uh, county commissioner job and a party shouldn't play that big of a role. You really need to look at what do the people need, what do they want. My ideology is I really don't like to increase taxes. I like limited government. I like responsible government. I like transparent government. You know, for the first time when COVID hit, first thing we did was we stream all of our meetings. Those are the things I like. Those typically are Republican. But then they're also pretty typically a lot of Democrats feel the same way. You have to look at what is best for the county. When they created the state constitution and, and everything, um, cities, townships, when they have, they elect the mayor, when they elect their, their town council, they're nonpartisan. School board, nonpartisan. Well, why is that? Well, because you represent everybody and you're working with everybody. For some reason, they decided to leave all of the county offices. Uh, partisan, and I haven't figured out why a county clerk could be a Republican. Or I mean, what's a Republican county clerk versus a Democrat county clerk? Um, and I'll continue when I come back because it's all <laughs> So, as I stated earlier this evening, I am a libertarian, and I believe in everything that that means, right? And and I think it's important to make a distinction between party and ideology. So. I agree that party shouldn't matter when you're executing your roles as a county commissioner. But your ideology is everything, okay? And I, and I truly believe that. You know, for everything that comes across my desk, I ask myself two questions. One, does this provide more freedom for the residents of Park County? Two, is this good for Park County? If the answer to either of those two is no, then not only will I not support whatever it is, but I will actively oppose whatever it is. Because I do believe that less government is good. I do believe that the government should stay out of your lives. I do believe in limited interference. Um, you know, why should someone in county office decide how many outbuildings you can have on your property? Why should someone in county office decide uh, um, if you can't on your property? 
why should someone in county office decide how you're going to use your land or live your life? They shouldn't. My political ideology tells me that. So therefore, I can't support something that goes counter to that. Yes, we should all work together, 100%. Should I look at someone that I'm talking with and see that they have a different letter next to their name and automatically discount what they have to say? Absolutely not. At the same time, putting an R next to your name doesn't make you a conservative. It's your actions that matter. It's your words that matter and the actions that follow those words. At the end of the day, I want to interfere with you as little as possible and allow you to thrive. My ideology is important to me and I think it is a basis on which to vote for me. So, is it important to you? That's something that you have to decide, but you're always going to know the answer to my question, the answer to your question before you even ask it. Does it provide more freedom? Is it good for Park County? My answer is going to follow those guidelines. You know, the whole um, zoning is because you buy a residence. You want to live in a residential area. You'd like to be protected from things that aren't residential. Well, if you go with the libertarian, you can't do that. That means that, uh, okay, I'm going to put 12 outbuildings on my, my tiny little lot to where it looks like it's a, a house with just all of these outbuildings, and I'm going to run little businesses in it. That's what the libertarian would want to do. They want to let you do whatever you want. We live in a society that, is, that, that can't do that anymore. We've gotten to a point, you know, with over 300 million people in the U.S., we do need some guidelines around things. We need the guardrails, so... When you buy a lot and you build a house in a residential area, you know it's going to be a residential area. One of the biggest complaints that I've gotten is from someone running a business in their house. And I say, well, what type of business is it? Well, they're doing log cutting and this, and, and you, you kind of look at it and say, okay, that is not allowed in our county. If you're going to do that type of thing, you need to buy agricultural land. You can't do it in a residence. Because these people wanted to buy a house in a residence. We get complaints in uh, South Park from people that have built a really nice house. And they look out and they see campers on all these lots. And you think, okay, well, they're camping there. No, they aren't camping there. A lot of people buy a lot of Park County, buy an old trailer, used trailer, and they'll go up and park it on a lot. They go up for the first year and think, oh, this is wonderful. They go up the second year, ah, oh, this is absolutely great. The third year, the kids got involved in baseball. This happens, this happens. Suddenly that camper, is now on that vacant lot, starting to get in a state of disrepair. And if you've ever been over in Park County, they have rats. Over on this side, we really don't have rats. But I mean, they have rats. And we have had to take down some of those things that are totally rat infested. It is a health hazard. I agree. I would love to say people can do anything they want on their property because I know everybody is going to do what is best for everybody. Well, that's a utopia. That's a few other ideologies are based on that. To be a true libertarian, you have to just understand and hope that everybody will follow what you think is good because then it'll work. But people aren't that way. You always have those few that cause them all. You know, it's a, it's a common misconception. A lot of people tend to forget that last part of my statement that says, unless you're harming another, right? So if you talk about having five shipping containers on a property, and then on another property you have one shipping container that's leaking sewage, which one of those is a problem and why? Is it because I have too many of them, or is it because I'm causing a health and safety issue for myself and my neighbors? When you talk about the rats, that's a health issue that's already covered under health and safety codes. I don't need to limit the amount of buildings you have in order to enforce safety. It's a red herring. I'm, if you live on a half acre lot and have 10 shipping containers, there's a way to deal with that, it's called HOAs. You know, we on this side of the past, almost all of it is HOAs. If you choose to live in a community that has bylaws that will not allow you to have more than X, Y, and Z, then that is your choice, and your neighbors and the homeowners association can enforce that. Should the county decide that someone, someone in Hartzell or someone in Guffey has to abide by the same 
HOA rules as someone in Bailey? Absolutely not. Instead of looking at core issues, they're looking at aesthetic issues. If someone has a camper next to me and it's ugly, I can choose not to look at it. If someone has a camper next to me and it's ugly and it's dripping sewage into the ground, we got an issue. We need to talk about how our property rights end at our property lines. And within those property lines, we should have as much freedom as possible. Thank you, I appreciate that. Then why are you the best candidate for this position? And then after each of you takes three minutes of uh, time to answer that, and uh, two minutes of rebuttal time, we'll have a five minute intermission, and then we will read audience questions. I forget who's first, you guys probably know. Thank you. So, what, why am I best for this position? Because I don't need it. <laughs> I don't necessarily want it. But I feel that it's necessary. You know, uh, I'm not running for commissioner in pursuit of some higher office down the road. I'm not running for county commissioner to put a feather in my cap. I'm not running for county commissioner to try to be important. I'm running because I truly believe that this county needs more transparency and needs more accountability. We also need to focus on what's best for our county and not be pushed around by state interests. You know, the state is always going to concentrate on what's best for Denver and Boulder and Colorado Springs. That's not necessarily what's best for us as a county. We need to make sure that our voices are heard and our needs are met, both on a county level and when dealing with outside agencies. But if you really want to know why I'm the best candidate, it's because I can make some very, very simple promises to you. I will answer your phone calls. I will respond to your emails. I will listen and consider your concerns and questions instead of just waiting for my turn to talk. They sound like very simple promises, because they are, but it's something that is amiss in this county, and it needs to change, and it needs to change from the top down across all levels of county government. You know, at the end of the day, the people of Park County will decide in November whether they want smaller or larger government, whether they want more or less freedom, and whether they want higher or lower taxes, and a slew of other things that we have and will continue to go over tonight. Um, I'm just glad that we've been given this opportunity to share these views with us, and just remember that you do have a choice. It's interesting he said that you know he doesn't necessarily want the job. If you don't want the job of county commissioner, you shouldn't have the job. It is a job where you are serving the people of Park County. And if that is not a passion for you, you should not be after this job. The fact that the well he doesn't need it. Well, I don't need it either. You know, at my age I can retire. Took retired four years ago. But I've lived in this county for a long time. I love this county and I know where the potential of this county uh, has. I think we're heading in a good direction. He says more or bigger government or less smaller government. Well, two things that I've done, uh, and they were recent because my first two years I had two commissioners that didn't want to do any changes to the LURs. Uh, then I got another commissioner in who said, yeah, I think we need to fix some of this. One of the first things we did is we took a look at residential. Because a residential lot that's one acre could have two outbuildings. A residential lot that's 40 acres could have two outbuildings. So instead of having it tied down to to uh, G, it's a residential lot. We changed our zoning, so it is now based on size of lot. So if you have one of those bigger lots, you can do more with it. Camping regulations. I was attacked well, vehemently on my change on the camping regulations. I ch I was trying to change the camping regulations from being able to camp two months on your property without anything, and then. If you wanted that third month of the year, you had to do a septic. I was trying to change it to where from April 1st through October 31st, you could camp on your property, period. Didn't have to do a septic. And then if you were going to do it during the winter, we wanted you to get a permit, mostly because we need to know who's out there, so when they call emergency services, we know what we have to do. We know where you are. Uh, smaller government is good. 
I mean, you know, Park County is a really a small government. We have the lowest, or some of the absolute lowest taxes in the state of Colorado. We talk about being pushed around by the state of Colorado. We are the state of Colorado. Counties are not like the state as a member of the United States. Counties are geographical areas carved out by the state legislature to make it easier for them to administer their policy. We're stuck with that. So, we keep pushing back and keep working. I do a lot of work with CCI, which is Colorado County Zinc. Uh, our, our whole thing is trying to get local control. The legislature, the governor, like to have the top down, hey, we're going to make the rules, you follow it. We like to have the, okay, if you make the rules, give us the option to opt out or opt in. Because some of your rules don't make sense for a rural county. Those are the type of issues that you constantly have to work. And he says earlier, he said, well, yeah, I don't see you doing anything to see that. You know, being visible is not necessarily the best way to get things done when you're working with a government agency. You keep working. You probably didn't see me down testifying of a uh, quite a few times now at the state legislature on bills that were going to hurt us and bills that would help us. I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room has at one point in their life done something they didn't want to do and then that thing went on to become one of the more fulfilling things that they've done in their lives. When I say that I don't necessarily want to do it, I also say that I feel obligated to do it. Because I feel that helping the people of Park County realize more freedoms is one of the most fulfilling things that I could end up doing with my life. So, it's unfortunate that those words were twisted. But moving on, when I talk about transparency, I'm not asking that Mr. Elsner film every meeting he has with CDOT. I'm asking that they let us know what they're working on, that they're on our side, you know? Um, let them let us know how he feels about the situation that he's got our back. You know, I don't feel like the county has my back. I don't know if any of you do. No. But I don't. I want an accessible government. I want to be able to pick up the phone and call someone and leave a message and know that they care and that they will get back to me to tell me they care and ask how they can help. The government should not be a barrier to our dreams and aspirations. It should be helping with that. So every time that I call to get a permit and that permit's not available, or every time I call to get my road graded, and I don't get a call back. At this point, I don't even care if the road gets graded. I just want them to let, them know, let me know that they're not going to do it so I can do it myself. we got plenty of people that we can do ourselves, right? I want some transparency. I want some accountability. I believe that's the most important thing that we can have in this county. And it's what you're voting on. I heard someone say that they don't think the county has their back. That's you know. on the light on 43, you don't. Well, you don't. No, no ma'am. No, ma'am. That's not what we're doing here tonight. Okay, you don't. Thank you. Um, we do have the back. If you look at the, the COVID, when they, they did the shutdown, we wanted to start opening up our restaurants before the state was going to let us. The county sat down and said, okay, what type of variances can we do? We went after variances so we could start opening up our restaurants. We could start opening up our businesses. We went after variances so the churches could reopen before the state was going to allow it. We went after a variance so we could have a state fair. We do have your back. We do work on things. And it's a constant. There are lots of issues that go on that you don't see, and quite frankly, you might be bored with it. I find it just fascinating and fun. Health and Human Services, trying to make sure we have the funding that we need for it. COVID put us in a really tight spot. We have people that are really hurting out there that need assistance. How do we make sure our county gets some money? I sit on the the, uh, the board that does the TANF allocations, which is the, the temporary aid for needy families. It's a state board. We do allocations of the TANF funding. How do, 
can of money. How do I make sure Park County gets their share? Well, Park County got more than their share this time. These are the type of things that you constantly do, that you're constantly working on. No, it's not out in the open. No, you can't have everything in the, the open. Yes, I do try to work with everybody. I do try to keep things going. Um, and again, to, to walk into this position saying, well, I think it's my duty. No. It's something that you should want to do, you should be passionate about, because this is a full-time job. I don't know if you understand that, but this is a full-time job. You will be paid roughly $84,000 a year to be a county commissioner. That is set by state law. We cannot accept less than that. That's what the state said. They said it. That is what it's going to be. It's a full-time job. Unless you want to take this job and be passionate about the job, you have no business in the job. Thank you. I appreciate it, everyone. Let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll get to audience questions. Okay, so, yeah. let's, uh, if we can, take our seats and begin the audience questions portion of our debate. I will, uh, these are handwritten, so bear with me as I read them. Some of them are two-part questions, so we're really going to get our money's worth here at, uh, down the stretch. And uh, the first one, before I even ask, I want to remind you gentlemen that I think we said three minutes on these. Three minutes, no rebuttal. Um, and who's going first? I appreciate you helping me with that. Six, no. Maybe. Okay. Well, we'll go first. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know that there's any real advantage either way. So. Well, not a rebuttal there. <laughs> if you have a rebuttal, there is. What are your, our, Mr. Elsner, what are your thoughts on the jail? And that's the way the question is written. We've, <laughs> we've, made, it, we've made it a little more specific and asked. Is it too large, and can it be put to other uses, in your opinion? Well, I, um, my first thought is, yeah, I think we need to do a bit of um, You know, the jailhouse, and you can, it's got to be a tourist attraction. Um, the jail, it has been discussed for the last 20 years. You know, my personal opinion of the jail is, I would love to have a jail that could just handle Park County inmates. With an occasional overflow from other counties. It's nice, you gotta have a spare room. And in you know, Lake County, they've got problems with their jail with mold, so we're housing some of those. I mean, that would be to me the ideal, that we just look after our own. The reality of it is, with that building, we can't do that because we can't afford it. It's uh, not the newest as far as design, there would probably be better ways to do it. So then we get into okay, at what point do we say, what's a good number? How do we finance the jail? How do we cover the costs? Um, and that's why, you know, a year ago, we had such a fun discussion with the sheriff and I, going through how do we do this. Uh, in the past, um, we, at one point, we had I don't know over 200 inmates, and the jail cost us I think somewhere around seventy-six thousand dollars. And then we'll have a, okay, we didn't have very many other inmates from elsewhere, so the jail cost us you know one point four, one point five. Uh, I would like to see us work on a smaller jail. Um, I think uh, with the sheriff's department, uh, working with the sheriff, I think we're doing a study that we're hiring a contractor that specializes in jails to come in and take a look at what we have, what we need, how can we make it more efficient, is it worth salvaging, uh, and then go from there. It's old, uh, we need a lot of new equipment, but that's kind of the direction I would like to go. Um, I don't think Park County should be in the business of running a prison. I think we should be in the business of running a jail. Okay. At the end of the day, we're required to have that, right? So the next question is, how do we make sure we're not losing a ton of money every year, right? So 
obviously, working with the sheriff's department to determine how we can stop the bleeding is the first step. You know, it, it takes the same amount of deputies, whether you have one inmate or 50. Let's get to that 50 <laughs> so that we're not losing as much money. Now, I'm all in favor of making it smaller. I don't believe that building a new one is an answer. I can't imagine how building a new one when we already paid off the bonds on the old one is a fiscally responsible answer. If we can downsize it, if we can upgrade it, if we can make it capable of holding the amount of people that it needs to hold in order for us to not lose money, and I'm not even talking about making money, I'm just talking about not losing money. And I'm certainly not talking about trying to incarcerate more people in order to make more money. I'm talking about reaching to outside agencies, outside of Park County, that need somewhere to put their inmates. Um, it's something that ultimately needs to be done with the experience and expertise of our sheriff. I do not pretend to be a law enforcement expert, so I rely on the experts around me. Um, but ultimately, if we are going to keep it, which we are required to do, then we need to do everything in our power to make sure that it is not losing money. Okay, back to a familiar topic. Uh, please explain why you are for or against Proposition 1 and how it directly benefits property owners or slash homeowners in Park County. When you read 1A, it sounds wonderful. We're going to make sure that the county continues to get the same revenue that it's used to, and it's not going to raise your taxes. My understanding of the not raising taxes bit is that that part is inaccurate. Not lowering taxes when legally allowed to do so is raising taxes. Getting rid of the ability to vote every year on a mill levy increase is not not raising taxes. It's a lot of pretty words that at the end of the day I think are going to hurt our homeowners and lead to higher tax bills. Now, I'm not an expert on Gallagher, I'm sure Mr. Ellsbury is. I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are. While I might not be an expert on Gallagher, I do believe that supporting a ballot measure that either intentionally or unintentionally misleads the voters to vote for a potential tax increase on themselves is both immoral and unethical. I encourage you all to actually read the proposal, to listen to Mr. Elsner, who is in favor of it, and to determine for yourself whether it's good for yourselves and for our county, and I myself will be voting them. A few of the, uh, of the things he said aren't correct. Um, you don't vote on a mill levy every year. You can vote on a mill levy, and mill levy increase any time your county decides we want to put it on the ballot. And that's it. We have to put it on the ballot, then you can vote for it. So that's that's not part of the equation. Tabor which is what we have. We have not been Bruce in Park County. So we are limited on how much money the county can spend. It's our Tabor County. It goes up at 2% a year, typically. It's the CPI, which is Consumer Price Index, plus um, any new building. So it goes up a little bit. The county portion of your taxes, and I have to remind you to make sure you're looking at just the county portion, because there's a whole lot of taxes on that tax bill that the county doesn't control. The county portion of that bill can't go up more than two, two and a half percent a year, unless there's a big shift. Gallagher says that uh, the state legislature can set the RAR lower. It can't set it back up. Why can't it set it back up? Well, Tabor doesn't allow it to do that. So we've had this ratcheting down on our, our residential rate. The biggest problem we have is that the state legislature, if Gallagher isn't repealed, the state legislature may be forced to, because of Gallagher, to put the residential assessment rate down around three, three and a half, maybe four percent. If it goes down that far, the county will not be able to collect the money that we collect right now. 
yes, you guys would have a little bit of a tax break. Oh, cool. The county will not be able to fund the sheriff's department. We can't fund the I don't know, 20 things that we fund with your, your money, health and human services. So what this does is it says, if the legislature drops the RAR to a point where we drop below our Tabor cap, because right now we're at our Tabor cap, when we drop below it, we can float our mill levy up so we're back to where we were. Now, is this is where you get into semantics. Is that a tax increase? Well, you're paying the exact same amount. So is it an increase? Well, if I would have gotten a decrease, then yes, it is an increase. Well, no, you're paying the same amount. That's what the county needs to be able to operate on. Give you an idea, Plant Canyon Fire did this same initiative two years ago. Uh, Northwest Fire did the same thing. And I believe it was Jefferson Como did the same thing. It passed those three areas by 70%. Because people understand, we aren't trying to raise your taxes, we're just trying to stabilize our income so we can provide the services. For us to be able to raise taxes above the Tabor cap, we would have to go to a vote of the people. So, Tabor is the one that really you need to look at. If Tabor is ever repealed, I think we're in all in a whole lot of trouble. It's the one that keeps things under control. question was written, what are your views about existing land use regulation in Clark County? And then, uh, as a second part of that, do you think there are immediate changes that, short or long term, that should be looked into? Our land use regulation suck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't like most of them. I, 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 we really, you know, they were modeled after Boulder when put everything together and we need to change it. We started doing that the first thing we did as I mentioned earlier we changed residential to where you do have more uses on your property um, and it's also based on the size of your property. It used to be that if you owned agricultural, if you owned a five acre agricultural lot you had to come either re you had to rezone your lot to residential before you could put a house on it. Well we've changed that. You know it doesn't matter. You can put a house on a five acre agricultural lot. Who cares? If it's, a, if it's a legal lot, you can put a house on it. Those are some of the changes. Um, we need to work on some of our commercial. And that's one of the next things that we were tackling was some of the commercial zoning and trying to straighten it out because it's, it's not clear in a lot of cases. It's very restrictive in a lot of cases. We need to make it better to be friendlier to businesses. Uh, animal regulations. How many animals can you have? You know, you had three guys that were, uh, that when they created that, None, none of them had livestock. Nobody knew. I mean, they couldn't figure out, well, when is a, a, a you know, a baby horse, a colt, uh, a horse? And so, well, when does it become a horse? Well, it's, it's easy. One is weaned. Now it's a horse. Before that, it's a colt. So you have a mom colt. You know, the same thing with cows. You've got a, a mom calf pair. So we need to change these things to make them make more sense. There's a lot of uh, the regulations that we do need to clean up. We need to make them better for the people of Park County. We started on that. Um, I think we had a little, you know, quite a momentum going back in March, and then COVID hit, and then we said, well, we aren't too sure how we're going to do hearings, so we're going to not do any hearings until we can figure it out. Then we got into, okay, now we can do hearings. But it's something that uh, I have a lot of problem. I want to be able to have people sitting in the audience as well as on Zoom watching the meeting, because I don't want people sitting there talking to us, because it's a lot easier when you look at 30 or 40 people and everybody's going, oh, yeah, or, you know, you, you get a much better sense of where everybody is rather than just one at a time. So, yeah, I think we really do need to look at our land use regulations. We started on that process. It's not easy. It's got to go through the planning commission. You know, it starts off, we give it uh, the building department directions, it goes to the planning they, they come up with, this is what we think. We look at it and say, yeah, it's pretty close. It goes to the Planning Commission. They have to review it, make sure they understand they make additions, changes. goes back to building, yeah, everything's okay. Then it comes to the commissioners. Then we start having public hearings. 
So it's not an easy, short process, but we are headed there, and that's, you know, it's going to take time, but I think we're going to make a, a lot of improvements. Now, I, I agree with Mr. Elsner that the existing land use regulations are pretty terrible. Um, the difference is, is that he voted to approve them, right? Now, he will tell you that they're better than they were, right? Well, that's like taking a car with two wheels, putting a third wheel on it, and saying it's better than it was. It's still not as good as it needs to be. You know, we had an opportunity as a county to make them as unrestrictive as possible, and instead we're taking baby steps. And I, and I understand a lot of that is back and forth, as he explained, a lot of things we need to, you know, uh, flesh out, make better over time. Land use regulations really aren't one of them. We can make dramatic changes to our land use regulations that allow you, as a resident citizen of Park County, to do what you will on your land as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. It's that simple. If you want more restrictive regulations on your property, you have the option to move to an HOA. If you don't, we shouldn't be putting those restrictions on you. So yes, it is very important to me, and one of my top priorities, should I be elected commissioner, to try to further the least restrictive land use regulations possible for our citizens. This is a two-part question to close out our question from Nagy. What can commissioners do to attract more businesses to Park County? And as a commissioner, what policies would you promote to attract businesses to Park County to increase the sales, uh, sales tax? You need me to repeat that? No, I think I got most of it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's a difficult question. I appreciate whoever asked it. Um, you know, when I go into Bailey, and I do quite a bit, you know, I drive through it every day and spend a lot of money there, you know, at our, at our local businesses, as I think one should. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to attract businesses when you don't have infrastructure, right? It's hard to attract businesses when you have using Bailey as an example, two towns separated by 285, right? Um, we're not going to attract businesses specifically to that area without doing something to improve the pedestrian experience for people that want to have businesses there. We also have things happening in this county that are trying to take away businesses, such as removing the light at 285 and 43. We have very successful small businesses that have been created within the last one or two years specifically because they know that that light is there and the traffic is diverted to them. That's how they make their living. A lot of that's going to go away, right? Um, we need to look at commercial taxation. Um, you know, commercial property taxes in this county are extraordinary. Like trying to look at a business or look at a piece of land and purchase that land and build that business or, or, uh, or purchase that business and all of a sudden you get slapped in the head with 10 to 20 grand worth of property taxes a year, suddenly your business plan doesn't look so great, right? We need to do what we can with our existing taxes to be able to attract businesses to Park County, to attract business owners to Park County because 20 to 30 percent of nothing is nothing, right? So. I appreciate what we've done through the COVID experience as far as trying to help our businesses out. I think we could have done a lot more. Um, I think we could have done a lot less with Cal Towing to the state trying to mirror their health regulations and a little more of, hey, we know what's best for our businesses and our people. Um, but overall, the only way we're going to get more businesses to open is to improve the infrastructure, and reduce their taxes. Um, on the COVID thing, yes, we mimicked the state because we have no choice. Uh, state law is what affects the, the state law or state health orders. 
Uh, we did it to try to encourage people to follow those orders because we were having a lot of trouble with you know, the short-term rentals. They were renting them where it was against the law in the state. So we did everything we could. You can't push back against a health order like you can many other things. It is enforceable by law. The, uh, the state patrol, the sheriff, uh, the district attorney, her comment was she will not enforce executive orders because she's not sure those are enforceable. But state health orders are enforceable and you have to follow them. We did apply for variances. We tried to open it up. How do you attract businesses to Park County? Well, one, we need more commercial properties. Uh, if you take a look, our master plan that was created a few years ago really limits where we can have commercial properties in this county. We need to take a look at it. We need to take a look where can we put commercial property. Right now, over here, we've got Bailey. We've got the top of Pearl Hill. And beyond that, there isn't anything or any place you really can build a business. Fair Play side, we've got the town of Fair Play. Well, they're kind of in control of their destiny. We don't have any control over anything they do. But along with the outside, yes, we can encourage businesses, but we have to have um, the property that they can buy. Taxes, that's state law. 29%, that's what a business pays. Their value on their property is assessed, just like everybody else's. They come up with this as the appraised value of the property. You multiply that times 0.29, and that is the basis for your taxes. So they, they pay 29% based on their assessed property. Uh, residential 7115. Is that fair? No, I don't think it's fair. I'd love to see a change. We can't do anything that's set in the state constitution. We can't touch that. I'd love to. But it's just, how do we attract businesses? Well, we got to help our businesses stay open. Affordable housing is one of the huge things. He made a comment that the county has lots of land we can use to put up affordable housing on. No, we don't. We don't have that much land. We have a lot of parcels out in parcel, out there where nobody really wants to live um, because otherwise people would be buying them from us. You know, we try to sell our, our property. Uh, two years ago, we had a big sale to where we went through and did an inventory of all the property that we have, and we said, okay, um, we're going to put all this up for sale. We're going to let the people on both sides have first choice because our goal is to try to get them to combine the properties. We did that. But we've got to be able to provide affordable housing, which is one of the things I've been working on with Elkamar and uh, Habitat with Humanity. We're, we've got a project that we're starting in Fair Play. Uh, hopefully, as soon as that one gets going, we've got another project we can do in Fair Play. And then we also have a project maybe we can do over here on county-owned property that we can use for that. I'd like to thank both of you for what I call a terrific debate. Audience, uh, maybe a hand for the question. <laughs> Thanks to everyone, and everyone have a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.